The, uh, the title of the, uh, of the panel is uh, Integrating the Geosciences, but um, thinking about it for the past two days, um, I realized that that's probably not the right title. Um, I think we should have called it Integrating the Geoscientists. Okay, and if you think about that one, okay, the problem ultimately, I, I, and I think this is a really important point, the problem ultimately is not about data integration. Uh, the problem is really fundamentally integrating the disciplines. And therefore, when we talk about integrating the disciplines, we're talking about people, talking about getting the expertise from different disciplines to work together. So anyways, that's a kind of comment. Uh, so good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Exploration 17 Symposium panel discussion. Our conversation today will focus on the challenges and rewards of tight or tighter integration between geoscience disciplines in mineral exploration. The objective of this evidently is to improve effectiveness and efficacy of the exploration process, to reduce the time to production decision, and to, re and to reduce the risk of that decision, because we know that exploration projects is, is ultimately about a decision, it's about, about a financial decision about developing a, an ore body. More importantly, it's meant to reduce the high frequency of failed diamond drill hole target testing. First, I would like to make a somewhat polemi polemical statement, polemic statement about the problem. I don't necessarily think things are as bad as I will state, but actually I really do. But the point is just trying to stimulate a reaction on the part of the, our panelists and, and you, the audience. Close collaboration between all major and minor disciplines in the mineral exploration process is important at all stages of development of the project. But it's important particularly during the early pre-discovery stages when there's really a very, not very much information and there's a very high risk of failure. It's easy to make the case that a diamond drill target should benefit from inputs from geology, geophysics, geochemistry, financial economics, and other disciplines. And many companies do have business processes that require formal inputs from all these various disciplines. However, it's th if, this, it is, if this is true for early stages of projects, when much less is known about the geology of the target and surrounding area. Several examples come to mind of regional projects driven by airborne geophysics or remote sensing in which the process was mainly focused on identifying and ranking targets on the basis of a few basic geophysical parameters. The assumption being that the geology was too poorly known in any event and that the exercise being statistical would overcome the gambler's ruined dilemma that, that Professor Brian McKenzie, if you remember, at Queen's so often warned us about. The compelling argument about geophysics and even geochemistry is that they operate independently of geology via the direct detection of drillable targets. It's like Cheech and Chong in the, in the film uh, Up in Smoke, when they were impersonating the cops and one of them turns around and says, we have no badges. And the other guy answers, we don't need no friggin' badges. Applied to us, it says, we don't need to know about the geology surrounding the anomaly because it is an anomaly and that as such has intrinsic potential to be an ore body. An anomaly is an anomaly, right? Not really if the standalone probability is vanishingly small because we, all, because we all know that most anomalies of anything are not related to mineralization. Just look at the number of wildcat holes drilled in the Abitibi historically and how many deposits have been found. Even if we use the lower bar of the presence of metallic mineralizations, the odds are still abysmal. What happens when you add additional knowledge to your anomaly in the form of facts from another discipline? Well, then the odds of, dis of discovery significantly and sometimes spectacularly increase. As we've, saw, as we've seen with the weights of evidence method with using Bayesian inference, that has shown that combining anomalies from different geoscience disciplines has a disproportionate effect on the chances of discovery due to the conditional probabilities of superimposed or overlapping anomalies. Even in advanced projects, how often do we bring in the metallurgist after the initial discovery hole to ensure there are no fatal flaws in the project? in the mineralization that would seriously compromise the economics of the project. How long did you wait to bring the mining engineer in to evaluate what a mining enhanced economic scenario would look like? Let's do a test, okay? We have about <clears throat> 150 people in the room. Raise your hand, those of you who have a close professional acquaintance that is a mining engineer or metallurgist. Actually, that's very good. That's very good. That's actually pretty good, pretty good. It's almost half. 
That's excellent. These would be the persons you would contact to ask questions about your project, questions that you may not be able to answer. Conversely, they may also have questions about the project that you can answer. So it's an, it's an important point. These issues are often particularly acute with junior, in the junior mining uh, companies that need to promote the discovery or die in the process. Any bad news about the deposit is better left to the major that will be stuck with the problem. The situation with juniors is often even more difficult in early pre-discovery stages of projects when there is a very strong incentive to get to the drill stage as quickly as possible and damn the torpedoes is often the, the battle cry. Unfortunately, most of us who have been involved in the junior sector have been caught in this situation and you try to make the best of it. However, in hindsight, it's often possible to see where the fatal flaw was and how if, in, and, 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 sorry, where the fatal flaw was and know that if you only had consulted with the, with the subject matter specialist, that person would have seen the problem. More often than not, juniors are like ants who are numerous, but for all purposes, randomly forage for food. The successful ants return to the nest and call on the group to exploit the discovery. Juniors and stock markets work in a similar way with many juniors unsuccessful, but a few making discoveries that are then rewarded with high stock price and additional financing. In today's financially financialized economy, more capital is made available to juniors to go out and make the discovery. However, the odds of discovery remain dismally low, and as we've seen with uh, Richard Shaw's uh, charts that everybody's been showing, most junior investments end up in failure. But if we, what if we could improve the quality of the drill targets that juniors typically take on? Would a tenfold improvement in technical successes in drilling make a difference for the average investor? Would twice as many discoveries result from a better coordination and communication between disciplines in the early stages of exploration le leading up to the selection of diamond drill targets? We have tried to assemble here today a small but diverse panel to discuss these issues. In addition to covering different geoscience disciplines, that is geology, ge geophysics, and geochemistry, we have tried to diversify both geographically and, uh, and uh, type of, uh, of, of employer. Uh, and also, we've, we've, uh, as, you've, as you, you probably noticed, we've, uh, we, we have both genders here present. Oh yeah, you count too. <laughs> so anyways, so our first panelist, as, um, as, as you, you've, uh, you, you've guessed, is Linda Bloom. She is founder and president of Analytical Solutions of Toronto. After earning an MSc at Queen's University in, in Geological Science, Linda gained experience as an exploration geochemist, planning and interpreting geochemical surveys across Canada and in many South American and African countries. She's recognized as a world expert on assay methods and has traveled extensively worldwide to review sampling and analytical procedures in various projects. Since 1989, she has also gained public experience with Citadel Gold, Gold Mines, Augen Capital, Canadian Shields, and Halo Resources as a senior executive and director. Her experience includes financing, regulatory reporting, corporate governance, joint venture negotiations, and exploration planning. Linda was awarded in 2013 the Queen's Jubilee Medal for her dedicated volunteer work in the mining industry. She served as a director of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada between 2005 and 2014. She was chair of the Canadian Institute of Mining Metallurgy, Toronto branch, and is past counselor of the Association of Exploration Geochemists and the Geological Association of Canada. She serves on advisory boards, including the CANMET, the Canadian Securities Administrators, the Mining Technical Advisory and Monitoring Committee, and the Canadian Innovation Can Foot Council on the Footprints Project Advisory Board. Our second panelist is next to me is, is Cam McQuaid, Principal Geoscience at, B, at BHP Billiton's Geoscience Center of Excellence in Perth. Cam graduated with honors in geology, energy, and fuel science from Lakehead, followed by a PhD in geology from the University of Saskatchewan. He then enjoyed 10 years with SRK, becoming Director of Australian Practice, focusing on exploration across all scales, project evaluation, geology resource, and geology mining linkages. In 2005, he became the inaugural director of Center for Exploration Target at the uh, University of Western Australia, undertaking applied research in the minerals industry, focused on the science of exploration targeting and building the next generation of mineral explorers. Under his leadership, CET built a team reaching 90 with a, with a budget of 60 million. 
CET research outcomes directly impacted on resource-based growth for partner companies led to target commercialization of targeting tools and leading software providers and provided the technical basis for the formation of two new exploration companies. CAM was founding member and co-author of the Uncover initiative. In 2013, CAM was awarded the Gibb Maitland Medal for the Geological Society of Australia for contributions to West Australian geology. In, 19, in 2016, he joined PHP Billiton as principal geologist in their internal geoscience center of excellence, providing expert guidance on mineral systems across all scales to, and help maintain and grow a high quality resource base. Our last panelist, but assuredly not the least, Ken Witherly, who many of you, many of you know, obviously, is founder and president of Condor Consulting of Denver, Colorado. Ken graduated from UBC, Vancouver, with a BSc in geology, geophysics and, and physics in 1971. He then spent 27 years with Utah BHP, during which time, as chief geophysicist, he champions BHP's program of airborne geophysics, which resulted in development of the Megatem and Falcon technologies. In 99, Ken helped form a technology-focused service company that specializes in application of innovative processing and data analysis to help drive the discovery of new mineral deposits. That's Condor Consulting. So the, for the, the format of the panel discussion will be flexible. I will ask each panelist in turn to provide us with a, a short statement if possible. Uh, I'll, I think we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. We'll, I'll ask a few questions, okay? Yeah. And uh, it'll give you a chance to, uh, to, to put in your plugs if you, uh, if you want. And, uh, and, and I certainly hope that you, you won't hesitate to be, uh, to be controversial in, in, in your statements. The first question will be going to you, Cam. Uh, tier one mining companies like BHP have, have economic threshold requirements for discoveries that make it very difficult to make the kinds of organic exploration discoveries that are necessary to actually move the needle for the company. In other words, searching for the tail end of the Singer distribution must really suck. It, it would like, I would like to point out, however, that RT have been fairly successful at this and made some pretty spectacular grassroots discoveries in the, in the past, like, past decade. How does BHP deal with the almost uh, absurd threshold requirements of, the, of its projects when trying to design exploration programs? Yeah? Uh, just having to look interplanetary now. <laughs> <laughs> Bring asteroids to Earth. No, the, I, I think the, the, the reason to have a threshold and understand what's going to be material to your business, and it'll be different whether you're a junior uh, uh, explorer or you're uh, um, one of the big major miners, you have to know what's going to make a material difference to the business. And the, the other, the, the scientific, that's the business underpinning of it. The scientific underpinning of it is that, on, by and large, when you look at well-explored mineral belts, where we have some feel for what the endowment is, they do so, show a size frequency distribution, right? So that if you have a district that has you know, an awesome deposit, like truly world class, uh, there'll be a lot of really good stuff. If you're in a belt that has one deposit that's big, but not spectacular, the rest are smaller, yeah. right? So if you can focus in on, on the, the geoscience that's gonna get you into those big areas, you just have a higher probability of finding a good deposit, right? Uh, and remember, it's not necessarily a single ore body that has to be that size. It can be a cluster or a district. Yeah. Right? So, for example, if you look at from uh, the Naranda camp. Oh, yeah, or metagamy right? camp. Yeah. So, you, you look at those areas, yeah. you know, any one deposit, and there's certainly some really uh, spectacular ones there, but if you, if you look at any one deposit, um, you know, the, the, real, the real benefit was the option value that came from being early into that district yeah. and being able to find all the other stuff around. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've got quite a bit of experience uh, working in, in metagamy where I did my master's uh, research. And uh, metagamy was an interesting example because the, it was originally discovered by airborne uh, geophysics in the early days in the, in the 50s. And, um, and the, uh, the, the first, basically the first drill hole in, that was ever drilled in the camp uh, was drilled into the metagamy lake ore body, which ended up being about 25, 25 million tons of, mm. of high grade. But like it was really, I mean, they basically they built the mine, they built the mill, they built C Z and Valleyfield, and they paid for everything in a year or two. It was like you know really, 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 really profitable. 
Uh, what's interesting is that, is that there's a number of discoveries were made afterwards, but, but the discoveries continued being made, and then eventually they got to greater depth. Mm -hmm. or, and the, but the latest one was basically virtually discovered near surface, and it's, a, it's on a project, a property that was, uh, that was uh, uh, how can I say, it, it had been, we'd, we'd known about the mineralization on the property for, since back in the 60s, almost like at the beginning of the camp. But it was always complicated. It was always difficult to interpret the geology. And, but with working it, eventually they, the, the company uh, eventually made the, 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 the key discovery that led to the, to the, uh, to the drilling of a, of, a, of, a, uh, of a resource that was sufficient to justify development. Mm -hmm. And since then, they've added to it. And it's become probably, uh, Perseverance is probably the second largest deposit now that was ever found in the camp after uh, uh, after Metagamy Lake? It's, it's a, that's a common thing, too, is that when, when you look at any mineral district, the, in any search space, like so without post-mineral cover on top of it, in any search space, the largest deposits tend to be found first. Yep. And that's because they have a, a larger footprint. So yep. You've got a, a higher probability of jagging them even from just systematic uh, uh, prospecting or exploration over the area. But they're not often recognized as the biggest. Yeah, until later on. Yeah. Linda? So, so uh, um, when I was uh, trying to develop a, a base metal project in uh, northern Manitoba, the uh, Sheridan District, um, which Ken helped on too, you'll recall. Uh, so what I found really interesting is that as a junior, you have uh, two choices. You can be a pro, uh, prospect generator. Yep. Um, and that's <clears throat> really and truly where your equation for putting the different geosciences together to, to improve drill success is really important. Um, but I also looked at um, if you didn't want to be a project generator and if you actually thought you were going to build a mine and, and how would you do that, and you start looking for potential partners in the base metal space, you find that things like uh, this was a VMS camp uh, with had uh, considerable production in the 40s, there aren't a lot of buyers. So in fact, uh, I believe that the juniors are much uh, more likely to be successful as a company and for their shareholders if you go looking for gold. You can actually build a, a, a gold project for a few hundred million dollars. Uh, you might even be able to finance that on your own if it's the right kind of project. Uh, and if you want to develop a copper porphyry, you need a couple of billion dollars. You're not going to be able to do that. You're going to have a partner that's a major, and you are going to get screwed. So it's not really a great model for a junior mining company. And, and when that, I say that, that I say it in the nicest possible way. <laughs> um, and, and one of the reasons is that there's just not a, lot of, um, not a lot of buyers, right? There are only so many companies that are even interested, that have the, the capital to move those kinds of projects forward. Um, so I think it's a really interesting, a sort of goes back uh, to actually what you were talking about, <laughs> defining uh, your, your business goals, mm. um, which is kind of off the, the geoscience topic. But it, I, think, I think it's an important part no, of what I, we need I, to I talk about as an, an industry. I think there's an important interaction between, between, the, uh, between the science of discovery and the, and, the, and the business of discovery. There's a very, very strong interaction. And you can't dissociate the two because that's when you get lost. Mm. In my view, you get, you'll get lost if you. As long as you focus on what makes sense for, for your particular business model. And this is one of the great things of our industry is we have all kinds of different business models. Okay, you can, you know, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of different, in, in different models. But the thing, whatever model that you, uh, you adopt, you, you, you has to make sense from a, from a business perspective. Ken, I want to ask you a question. I know you've been a very strong proportion, uh, proponent of multidisciplinary support for, for exploration program, projects, and that is one of the reasons I, I wanted you on, on this panel. If you remember, this was, a number, this was the number one issue that was raised at the closing of the Exploration 07. Remember that? We had a big discussion in our uh, wrap-up meeting. My question is this. Since 2007, <coughs> do you think this issue has become more present in the minds of your clients and your colleagues, or is it the same old, same old? Well, Charles, I, I won't say I'm embarrassed to say, but a colleague pointed out, I think when he saw the topic of this and I was on the panel, he reminded me that I had spoken at a PDAC in 1990 on integrated <laughs> exploration. So it's been out there for a long time. And, and as I sat over the weekend saying, well, what can I say to Charles' interesting topic that isn't trite, uh, not too controversial, but I 
I would express the feeling that if we have been staring at this issue for, for as long as that period of time, and we still are talking about it as if it's still an issue, there's a learning problem amongst the community. We, and it, it doesn't, it's not saying you need to be held back in class, but I think it's a combination of, of things. Uh, one of them is the semantics. Uh, I think integration is maybe not the right word. It's, it's a gestalt that's different than simply bringing together. And in a talk I had a chance to give, you unfortunately weren't there in 14, but I was talking about integration to a group of geologists, and I wanted to express what I thought wasn't integration, even though it looked like integration. It was a bus, picture mid-1950s in Alabama, and the whites sat forward, and the blacks sat at the back, and they were actually integrated. A colleague of mine said, well, at least they were on the bus. So, you know, we're in, we're in, a, we're in a way that we have our separate uh, identities, even if we seem to be carried along in the same platform through, you know, the exploration business. Yeah. The geochemists are the ones at the back of the bus. <laughs> no, you're hanging on. You're on the roof. <laughs> is that, can, I want to. I want to ask you a question. Is that is one of the challenges that a lot of the technical specialists and geophysics, I think, is a really big one, right? Is that I look at the trade show out there. A lot of the geophysicists are in those types of companies, right? And so they're either, and I, and I mean this in the nicest way, yeah. but I mean, I think there's a, there's a I'm just borrowing from yes, you. Yes, you're allowed. <laughs> but okay. but it's a, is that either consciously or subconsciously, there's the risk of pushing a tool, right? And, and, they, and also, the, the way the business model is in a cash flow business like that, you don't have the luxury, even if you have the vision of integrating, you don't have the luxury of actually getting out and doing that integration. Because that's the structure of the, of the business, you know, yeah. even when people see it, they struggle to implement it. Well, and with the, and, and some of your comments in the panel yesterday, I say, I don't have, I have a suggestion. Not necessarily an answer, but a suggestion. And, and I spent, as Charles said, a lot of my time inside BHP uh, working to develop new cutting edge technologies. The company thought we're gonna make a big difference in our discovery rate. Um, and then when I started Condors is using more or less existing technologies. But to me, that whole, that whole parade goes along really self-propelling. There's very little we have to worry about most of the time. It, it, it varies, you know, whether the geochemists have a good five years or the, or the geophysicists or there's some new geological models. But the whole body of knowledge and, and, and the ca capacity seems to be intrinsic to, to the people, and, and many of the geophysicists, I agree, their passion is the development of new widgets. How mm -hmm. it's actually applied is, is almost secondary. But what I, what I sort of thought on the weekend was what we were missing, what I called the bookends. And, and Cam touched on it yesterday, and he said, we have to have a clear idea what we want in the beginning. And we have to have a clear idea of the geological aspects. We have to have a clear idea of the geoscience components. And we also, as I was sitting here and lost my cappuccino to the guy at the, at the door, <laughs> we have to have a clear idea of what our constituency will support. Because one of the things that we have is, is, is an activity that takes a large amount of time. And we know the 33-year-old the, the, the CFO of the company, he's an impatient young man, right? He's got a career to manage. And if we say we need five years or seven years to do a program, and he doesn't really understand what that means, he's gonna, within 18 months, he's gonna be on our butt. Now, Cam mentioned the oil industry. I know in the oil industry, the knowledge of process goes right up to the chairman of the board. I do not think that knowledge is present within most mining companies. Mm -hmm. It stops with the head of expiration. Then your hope is that you have a good communicator to, to the rest of the board. And the other part is the back end. It's the case histories, it's the, it's the analysis of how, why we failed. Because we often don't fail. We're technically successful, but that's regarded as, as bullshit, basically, most of the time. <laughs> but for us, it's the learning opportunity. Yeah. So we have to box in as a process and explain that to people that we're gonna get it right in the beginning and we're gonna do it right at the back end. Because one of the big things that we had when I worked at the company was, Expiration looked open-ended, and we acted that way. We go to West Africa, we freaking colonize the place. When are you going to leave? 
well, we can work with a lot less money than you gave us, but we'll keep the offices in Abidjan, right? And that frustrated people enormously because yeah. the management did not understand that the, 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 they thought that it was a project they were funding, not uh, an extension of a, a, a colonial activity. Yeah. So anyways, those are my thoughts to the integration. I think we need to change the, 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 the language some to, to, to yeah. enhance uh, in, an integration that we're already good on the technology side, but putting it just simply physically together, what do we want to get out of it? And we have to be able to communicate that to other people. Because if we can't communicate it to other people, we don't understand it ourselves. Yeah, That's cool. my feeling. I, I just want to go also back to expiration 2007. Yeah, please. Uh, but I have a quote from Bill Coker, yeah. um, who you know, unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, and I even noticed when you were listing all the, all the components to make something successful, you forgot the geochemistry again. Um, not that I take it personally. Um, so Bill Coker, Bill Coker wrote um, in 2007, there's also a definite need for a return to the basics of exploration geochemistry, including the proper application of geochemical techniques throughout the various stages of exploration from reconnaissance to detailed follow-up. But of greatest concern to the mineral exploration industry must be the survival of exploration geochemists. And unfortunately, I think that Bill would, would feel very much like I do that, um, um, you know, with his loss and, and the loss of people like Kirk Kaiser, I don't think we're winning on the uh, adding exploration. Yeah. yeah, on yeah, the exploration. The demographics don't look very good for um, you. And, and we do rely a lot on, on geochemistry to rank anomalies. And what seems to have gotten miss because I give you know workshops on exploration geochemistry is that real primary geochemistry story so you really need to understand chemical and mechanical transport of metals um, or other elements you're using as pathfinders and and this is a part of the silo problem so a lot of that knowledge is in the geography department they're the you know yeah. the, the the glaciologist is the the residual uh, residual laterite Physical formation geology. all that stuff is not in necessarily in the geology department and unless we understand the processes of formation and, and metal movement yeah. we're not going to be successful in, in following up targets it doesn't matter how much you model them yeah. um, and and it and it even speaks to how we're going to connect the geochemistry and the geophysics what I find sometimes is I'm talking to um, younger geologists. They've had a very good schooling, perhaps, in um, isotope chemistry, um, maybe lithogeochemistry, and they don't know that the chemistry of a soil is different, right? That the, the mechanics, uh, the yeah. processes are completely different. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and, and, and they totally struggle right. to understand why it's not the same. Okay. So I think yeah, that's yeah. a big, a big yeah. mess. Yeah, I just yeah. want to, uh, I agree with you. And, and you highlighted it at the end there, Linda, is that in fact, if anything, I find that the geoscience departments today are actually very strong on geochemistry, but not on exploration geochemistry. And the fact that how these metals behave in the regolith, in transported material, et cetera, and, and groundwaters, yes. that's, that's something that I don't see, or I'm not aware of many places doing that type of training of it's people. It's in the geography department. Yeah. <laughs> Or the environmental department. Well, I mean, was, or the and it was at UWA. At UWA, we had to go over to the yep. to, to the soil science people in that to find people that had that type of ability. So I have a question for you, uh, 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 Linda. Um, say, given that we have a, a, a geophysical uh, geophysical target or geophysical targets, um, what you raise here um, is about about geochemical sampling. Um, is do you have to cover the whole thing with a grid, or how do you, how do you, what what approach? Uh... I I think there's room to uh, again. It's it's about formulating the question in a different way. What is it we're trying to um, achieve. achieve? Yeah. So maybe in your particular circumstance, let's take the Abitibi. We've got hundreds of kilometers of EM targets. We got targets, that, you know, and they're millions, all legitimate targets. Of okay, yeah. millions of kilometers. Sorry. Uh, and of different age of, of different quality of airborne surveys. But the question, but the problem is we can't drill every 200 meters along those uh, anomalies. So what can we use to rank them? We use the geology, maybe the magnetics, to sort of make a geology map. We try and make up some uh, conclusions about structure. 
But is there a way that we can use geochemistry to rank which portion of that EM conductor we then want to go and do further work on? So the question is not, I'm looking for a geochemical target, I'm going to do a two kilometer by two kilometer, 25 meters space sampling. It's a different question. I just want to know how to rank my geophysical anomaly. And to, I, I've been in trouble before because I've said uh, that the question, is, you know, that a lot of companies, they're not going to drill a geochem anomaly without you know, some other foundation for doing it. So why are you doing blanket geochemistry when really what your, the proper question to ask is how do I rank my geophysical anomaly? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, it, it touches to, to a project that we, we had at, at Naranda back in the early 2000s where we were, we were doing the follow-up. Some people here probably remember that big Megatem project that, that Naranda did in the Abitibi where they flew you know, virtually you know, almost all of it. And um, so obviously we had a lot of targets, a lot of geo, 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 geophysical anomalies. And, uh, and we were in the Abitibi, so we were in the Abitibi. A large part of it was in the clay belt, uh, a lot of transported soil, overburden, um, the conventional res geochemical response on top of these, uh, these targets were, you know, it, for all purposes from a geochemical point of view, insignificant. But it was at the time where there was a, a high interest in partial uh, selective extraction geochemistry. And uh, so we designed a, a project to do exactly what you were, you were doing, where we would, uh, we, we would just cross over with a line, a single line over the, uh, over the anomaly and, uh, and with partial extraction geochemistry, see if we could uh, detect uh, something. And we had, uh, we had uh, anomalies that were over uh, high-grade massive sulfides. We had anomalies over barren sulfides. We had anomalies over graphite. And, uh, and the, uh, the conclusion at the end, after spending you know, over half a million dollars, was that uh, we can't tell. We can't separate these things for all purposes. There, there's no, no way to separate these, uh, these anomalies. But at least we knew that. So it's not something that we would have used if we could have, but we didn't because at the end of the day, it didn't work. You know? Cam, I have a, a question for you uh, about, about how it's, it's on the uh, educational side uh, within, within BHP. How do you, how do you design uh, the, the, the system that will that will basically develop the culture of the kind of, of, of exploration approach that, that you were talking about this morning? The, uh, well, the way we're doing it now, and, and I guess remembering that you know, we're, 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 we're building up that, that yeah, culture. I, I, I know, that's why I'm asking so, the question. Uh, and and the, I guess the worst thing to do would be to have a couple of the senior people sit in a room and say, this is the way we're going to do it. So the way we've done it, uh, uh, for example, in copper, is in all of our copper offices, so Tucson, Lima, uh, um, in uh, Santiago, in Adelaide, we've actually gone and done workshops. And in those workshops, we just have people say, what is it, what is it that's important? If we're going to go look for uh, a porphyry deposit, what, what do we look for? What's important? And everyone just throws it out on the table, just puts it all out there. And then we, had, then we actually went through the process of sorting it out. You know, so is this important? Absolutely, this is important. And at the scale of selecting the next belt, is that important? Absolutely, it's important. Can you measure it? Uh, no, not really. Well, then when, when would you be able to measure it? I'd be able to measure it at this scale. So, you know, we just sorted all that out. By doing that process, everybody that's in the room, hopefully, feels a little bit of ownership of the, when they see the final method, you know, the final procedure we have in terms of ranking our, our exploration targeting process, they see that, you know, I understand why it's like that, and they also feel that they've had a hand in building it. Yeah. And we've done that in, uh, in iron uh, for the iron mineral systems, and we've done the coal mineral system, right? And that was really quite eye-opening yeah. right, for people. Is so, it, ever come? It helps you weed out the weak thinkers, too. <laughs> and then they can be taken out. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> Transfer uh, operation. <laughs> Transfer uh, so I'm thinking about a, a, a much older case where there was a base metal company. Um, again, one that doesn't exist because 
I don't know, all of our Canadian companies don't exist anymore. That's right. Uh, so uh, they, they developed a system. It was, it was interesting because what they found was at the budget meeting time, and a lot of you probably been going through budget meetings, everybody gets up and has to talk about their project. And what they found is that it wasn't just the best projects technically that got the budget allocation. It was the person with the best sales skills, sure. right? It was, it, was, it was a lot to do with presentation and commitment and sellability. So, so they decided to do what you're doing to a certain extent, right? And they said, okay, so um, if we have uh, geophysical targets, they have to have at least this kind of, I don't know, ohms or gnomes or whatever they are. And I'm just a geochemist. I don't gnomes. know this stuff. Gnomes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so they, they boxed everything. Where they got into a lot more trouble and where they asked me to come and run a workshop for them was, and what geochemical number am I looking for? So if I have lake seds or stream seds, do I need 48 ppm nickel? Do I need 221 ppm copper? And that's where the discussion failed. Because in the geochemistry world, there's a lot of what ifs. What's my transfer? I, I, you know all this stuff, sure. right? It's much more complicated. Um, and I like to say like, so that, in fact, this company had done a very large project in northern Quebec, and they had identified a number of targets, and their problem was the prioritization, because what happened was they, they missed a big mine. So they had, uh, you know, they had identified a target with Lake Seds and Airborne Mag, uh, but it was target number 15. They went out for a summer, they got as far as target number 10, they didn't find anything, they lost their funding the next year. 10 years later, somebody else takes the same data, reprocess it, has the target a little bit higher, and makes a major nickel discovery. So it's, it's you know, it, it's about funding. <laughs> you have to have a commitment to the project. Um, and then you also have, the better your ranking system is, getting the, the better targets up top, uh, the more likely you'll be successful. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one, though, to, um, I think, to make the boxes too small, make, the, make those criteria, um, and make every project fit those criteria. Yeah, that's right. But at the end of the day, see, in that, in that particular case, you know, if you say, this is our understanding of, this, of, of, the, of, of what we need to look for, we've only got so many places we can go, we know we don't understand these things perfectly, but here's the way it's ranked based on our knowledge, mm -hmm. right? They don't hit that target. Someone else comes and finds it. They didn't actually make the wrong decision, if you know what I mean. From a from a from a learning process point of view, you know, people say, "Oh, but I mean, you, if you if you say, well, I'm just going to go do all of them and do a half baked job over all of them, you've got an even lower chance." Right? Do you know what I mean? I yeah. So I think you still you have to accept. That's what I was saying earlier. You've got to get away from I think or we as an industry, you have to get away from the fear of walking away and someone finds a deposit on something. Hmm. If you're doing the best you can, that's the best you could do at that time, right? Yeah. And I mean, then, we, we've seen companies walk away from projects that yeah. became mines, right? I mean, it's yeah. like, uh, look yeah, at all you told were yeah, masters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Pebble, uh, yeah. well, Pebble's yeah. not a mine yet, but yeah. I mean, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. but it's, it oh. certainly has the economics of it. I've yeah. got one I'd like to throw out. Um, Go ahead. It was a word I heard yesterday. Well, I've heard it before, but in it, this is a, geoscience context, but augmentation. Um, I find that kind of intriguing. I just watched Elysium again, and if you remember, our hero Matt was, was augmented so he could get up to the, to the ship, right? Uh, that's kind of like, you know, the Terminator type augmentation, but, you know, there's certainly some, some almost science fiction type approaches. I mean, caves, virtual reality boxes have been around now for 20 years. We tried it out, a colleague of mine up in Sudbury, they have a system there, Morocco, I think. He says, it's great, do it at least once, and then you've satisfied your need. You know, it's just sort of like, well, it's obviously not part of a work process if you just do it once. You, it's sort of like going to Disneyland. You, yeah, right. you only need to go once. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, are there other aspects of that which, you know, we could see building into the interpretation process that really would come outside of, of the, the standard geoscience box? Because we say we're innovators, but I don't see a lot of innovation that actually makes a difference. We see changes, but they're not necessarily, well, one of the things, they're not measured. You know, and if, you, if it's not measured, is it important? Yeah. But it just sort of becomes a buzzword that people say every year at the PDAC, I've innovated, I've got something new. But to me, if we can change the paradigm of how people interact with information 
and, and, and you know, I supported a kid at, uh, well, a young man at the University of Houston back in the late 90s, and he was doing audio and tactile as well as visual interaction with the seismic data set. He actually had feedback devices which allowed him to man manipulate <coughs> that data and feel variations in the patterns. And that was 20 years ago, and I don't know where any of that has gone. I mean, he wasn't plugged in in a, in a virtual reality sense, uh, you know, with, with electrodes in his arm or his brain, but it's getting pretty close. Uh, yeah. there's, there's people who've lost limbs now that it, are able to interact with physical mechanisms. Yeah. Is that a way of, you know, somebody was, Ted Urquhart was complaining about safety, and maybe that's, you know, rather than having drones on pilot, did you actually have people sitting in there plugged in in a different way? But anyways, integration, how do we integrate people into, into much more complex data sets than we've historically got? Yeah, and, and like, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm the chair of the Geoscience Committee at, at PDAC, and I was, uh, I was previously a director, and uh, obviously, you know, the, the whole junior mining sector is a real big constituency of PDAC. And, uh, and, and the problem of, of innovation is, is a really big one, because invention and innovation is not the same thing. Innovation is when, when a, a particular paradigm or a particular technology is actually integrated into the culture in, in terms of the way of doing things. And, uh, and the, 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 in the, the, I find, we find that in the, the junior mining sector, uh, you know, increasing, you know, in, in, increasing as the baseline in terms of the, the, the skills, the skills is hard uh, because funding is, is often uh, irregular and, uh, and there, there's, no, uh, there's often not a lot of continuity. There's, there's some juniors that are obviously well-structured, there's no doubt about that, but, there's, but if you look at the overall junior space, it's tough. It's a, it's, it's a tough environment with, uh, and, and uh, uptake of technology so that it becomes innovation is very difficult. I don't know, do you have any comments? Maybe you could ask the floor. For sure. Yeah, if there's any uh, people on, on the floor, in the audience we that, have, uh, there. that have, uh, would like to make comments or ask questions, there's two microphones in the, uh, or you can just uh, speak loudly and we'll repeat the, we'll repeat the question for the, uh, for, for the, but yeah, so, but, but anyways, what, I, what I'm saying is, is that, is that it's, uh, the junior sector is tough. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult uh, to get skills, the skills, and when we talk about integration, it's even more, it's even more difficult. It's, mm. it's hard. Well, I guess it, 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 uh, it asked the question if, if our business and, you know, the geochemical, I remember that discussion in 07 about geochemists because I think they tallied, there was, at, at the, it was strange, at the end of the meeting they said there was 26. And it was like, 42? No, there were 26 geochemists. And, but Valley had just hired somebody else and so there was a zero sum game. That's what they were doing. They were simply, they weren't generating new people into the industry, they were simply shuffling the existing experienced people around <laughs> and yeah and then eventually you know the I don't know how many we've lost since since 07 it's probably five or six of those yeah. those 27 without too many new ones coming in but um, do, does it mean that we have to go to spe specialization for juniors and say there's going to be certain centers you know like an equivalent of an Amazon or a, you know um, a target for for exploration as opposed to cottage industry activities because we all sort of suffer the same thing. We're undercapitalized to develop a lot of new technologies that are specific to our business. Uh, you know, groups like BHP might have, and Rio Tinto might have the monies for periods of time, but then they, they have to implement them, they have to spend as much money to develop it that could service the entire industry. They're, they're servicing maybe half of 1% of the, of the people. So it's a very, it's a very expensive activity. To, it's like training fighter pilots, you know, $30 million a pop. Uh, to have that, but if you spread that out is because at the end of the day I would think groups like BHP want to have those tier ones found irregardless because there's commercial Opportunities to get access to those that Ari are secondary to the primary exploration Ar discovery. A rising tide lifts all ships Exactly yeah. uh, right. I wonder if is uh, if Richard Hillis is in the audience at all Is he because uh, from the DET CRC because there's a good example Richard, I don't know, maybe if you want to make a comment about, you know, th th that's a great example, the DETCRC, about what Ken was just saying, how that 
that technology will be accessible to the industry in general. No. Microphone on the floor, please. It seems to be on, I suspect. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah it's come on now. Um, yeah, I, I guess there are, there are tides of that, aren't there? I, I, I run a consortium called the ETCRC. We've been very fortunate to have um, 60 million of cash, 150 million of cash in kind. And, and we've developed some new technologies, including a revolutionary new drilling technology. And first rights of that technology, of course, go to our sponsors, which include BHP and others. Um, but companies, I think, go through cycles of wanting to do that collaborative, in open innovation type leverage research. And some companies who are not in our consortium say, no, we don't believe in that. We'll only invest in research if we 100% own the IP because that's the only way we think we can return something to the shareholders. And I sort of quite passionately disagree with the second view, because it is, it is very siloed. It assumes that the people you contract and consult are the holders of all knowledge, and you're very poorly lever leveraged to it. It's expensive. So I, I am a great fan of that leveraged open innovation approach, and absolutely, it to work, it requires integration. It requires, you talk about across the disciplines, I think we need integration between the researchers and the industry and the, the suppliers. Yes. We've developed tools that work because we have fundamental scientists collaborating with suppliers who live or die by selling that technique. So I think that aspect of integration is important too. Uh, and I think as an industry, we don't use enough what the petroleum boys would call GIPs, joint industry projects. Um, they're just a no-brainer because they're fantastically leveraged and ultimately, ultimately, five years later, after some creaming has been done, the technology bleeds out to the whole industry. So thanks, just some thoughts there. Thanks for the invitation, Cam. Hmm. Uh, I think the, the, key, the key there for me was the fact that those types of, of, of consortia, they bring money from the industry, they bring the academic brains and industry brains and service provider brains that, that, uh, that need to come together to crack the problem, but they engage the service provider because, for example, um, in BHP, you know, we, we have no plans to become a drilling company. No, 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 right? yeah, yeah. So a technology like, yeah. you know, coil tube drilling into the uh, minerals industry is something we'd love to see to bring down costs, but at the same time, we realize that we don't need to own that IP, right? So. That's right. Excuse me. Excuse and, uh, you know, and, and things, uh, things, things yeah. sorry, go ahead, please. It's, it's please. Just a comment. Uh, I think there is a lot of focus on, on technology. I think we have seen over the past 10, 20 years coming a lot of technologies. I don't think our industry is somehow depleted in technology. There will be uh, more technologies evolving. I think what, uh, one of the problems is uh, our la labor, uh, the exploration is, in the exploration is world, uh, people still don't understand how to uh, interpret the data sets. So uh, technology, I don't see, is an issue. Yesterday uh, in the panel, people talked about the big data, the tsunami coming. I think we are already here. Well, the companies are already drowned in themselves in a lot of data. So the technology is one part, and it is very good seeing all these innovations coming, like hyperspectral, better detection limits with uh, geochemistry, uh, real-time collection of uh, mineralogy. But uh, there is the other side. And it's a, an industry that, in my opinion, is a kind of ill in, in the sense that uh, we don't have the uh, people with the capacity to do a, a very high level integration of, of, of the data sets. So uh, I, I think we should also focus the discussion on the human resource because I think technology will keep uh, flooding our industry. Uh, it's already advanced and I think it's always uh, years light years ahead of, uh, of what people can actually do with the data. So I think the human resource is a, is a very important part and the educational system perhaps need to address that issue. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree and, and uh, yeah, very much so. And uh, the, the uh, technology is one thing, but it has to be applied. And, and what happens today in particular is that uh, because we're going undercover, these technologies can't be applied. In many cases, they, they can't be applied by themselves. They have to be, the technologies have to be 
have to be applied with other technologies, and they can be in other disciplines. And, and uh, without the combination of these things, uh, you you just you just don't get targets that are very they're very good quality. Linda has a comment. I just want to thank Juan Carlos for his comments, yeah. um, and also just to say so um, in terms of human resources, what uh, I, we often see, I think, is the, uh, Juan Carlos calls it the low geochemical literacy, uh, which I think is a great term. Um, but we really are missing some mathematicians, people who uh, can do any kinds of statistics other than calculate the mean on an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and, and even that's not done on, uh, correctly. So the, it's, it's not maybe fair when there's a, a room full that's of, of people that are primarily geophysicists. I, my impression is geophysicists um, have slightly better math skills than geologists and maybe some um, geochemists. But if we're moving to big data, <laughs> it's not like we all have to be PhD mathematicians, but we have to be skeptical enough to ask the right questions about the quality of data that has to go into the model, what the algorithm is, and how we use the information when it's output. But I don't think we have certainly anybody um, sort of at the VP expiration level and higher in most companies that can even ask those questions. And we're going to get psyched into that hype curve, you know, of new technology, yeah. no yeah. matter what that technology is. And, and, we're, and we're going to have some failures as a result. And the, the point I would, would add to that, and it's, it's a good one about the, the technology tends to reinforce as it becomes more and more specialized. The, the siloization, I like the like gamification, make up a word. But I had a chance to look at it with the passing of, a, of a, a gentleman who contributed a lot to the initial use of aeromagnetics data for geological interpretation. And this was back in the 1950s. This is a guy called Prof Boyd at the University of Adelaide. And Norm Patterson, who may be in the room, also contributed to that when they worked at hunting. But what you saw back in the 50s was you had people that were, they had degrees in physics quite often. Geophysics didn't really exist. But you didn't have the silification because basically people could move back and forth between, and geochemistry was probably out Same. there, Same. but it wasn't specialized. They were all sort of uh, students of natural history. Yep. And they looked at, but then as knowledge grew, the specialization, oh, I'm a time domain EM person. I am a, I'm a, I'm a free air gravity person. I'm a halogen person, you know, it all grew. And, and for integration, it's very difficult, once those silos are created, to get people to yeah. share their information between. And that was the thing, as a, as a director of the CMEC Footprints, I could see the groups were really struggling because there's a strong component in the institutions we have created, either companies won't share or universities, or the people in driving universities, great researchers, the concept of, of actually sitting down at the table and saying, right, this is what I've done right, this is what I've done wrong, this is my ideas for the next five years. It's difficult to have those open conversations and then say, well, let's sit down and integrate all this information. What does it mean? The tendency is I do my piece and I pass it to the next person. It's like a, it's like a GM assembly line. And it's not, ultimately the car is integrated because it's in the mind of the designer. And you know, there's a, there's a shift boss that makes sure everybody does their job, otherwise they're thrown in the heap, right? But eventually you get a car, but geoscience doesn't work that way. No. We have to have to and fro, back and forth. What do you think? You know, geophysics gives you a model. How much does he believe in that model? Well, if you ask him it's, or her, it's probably not as much as you would think <laughs> if you're a geologist. Yep. But the thing is, they're not gonna say that on first principles. Yep. But they will in some sort of discussion where they feel they're not, they're not necessarily being attacked, that, that you know, there's a purpose for the model, and it could be changed. It's one of a million. You know, there's that trite statement. So I think the integration, the technologies tend to frighten people away from having conversations that are very important about, well, okay, this looks really powerful if we can measure these down to a part per billion. But it's still, it has to be put in context. And people put it in context, not technology. So good question, Mark. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Question? Gordon West, I'm an applied physicist, geophysicist, formerly with the University of Toronto. Certainly, I see huge changes in, in the geophysics industry. I won't speak to geochemistry. I don't really know the, that well. But uh, the applied geophysics uh, for mineral exploration industry 
in Canada has changed drastically over my lifetime. And, and <coughs> we are seeing a very strong shortage of people with any real experience and understanding of both the geology that they're trying to understand using geophysics and the, the geophysics itself. Yeah. And the reason is very simple. The, uh, just is what has been said, that the technologies are getting more complicated and they're being de developed by uh, technologically oriented companies that have to sell their product. Uh, they deliver the survey to somebody. These are uh, increasingly small uh, client uh, uh, exploration companies. And so uh, they do something with the data that's delivered to them. But in general, uh, if it helps, if it could drill hole results from it, uh, then fine, that's great. And if not, the data disappears. This is not like the older times when there were a few large companies working things when uh, geophysics was new and everyone in the industry knew that they had to learn what these survey data were uh, telling us about geology. So the results were file, filed uh, when uh, action was taken on the basis of data. Um, drill holes, were, and new surveys were, uh, were commissioned and so on. The same people looked at this and worked through the data inc incrementally. And as somebody with experience grew older, they could train new people. There is nothing like this in the industry anymore. There are har hardly any people in the industry or in the universities anymore who are interested in the true interpretation problem in applied geophysics. Now, <coughs> just to focus, I'll go away from my own specialty, which is electromagnetics, but into magnetics. We have fantastic aeromagnetic mapping uh, over uh, many areas. We have, uh, <coughs> but I've also worked in these areas in terms of regional geological structure. And there are enormous conflicts between what the geophysics is telling us and what the map geology, as best interpreted by good and very competent geologists, is telling you. And nobody ever anymore worries about these conflicts. <coughs> there is a total la loss of curiosity about uh, problems, and I mean scientific problems. So the industry has turned from uh, a nascent, being a nascent science to being an engineering discipline where we provide canned solutions to certain problems. Now, it's all very well to complain about this, but we have to try to do something about it. And I, the, the, what's mentioned here, uh, consortia are uh, ways of doing this. There is a lot of public domain data. There is a lot of public domain geology. There are students and so on who would be pleased to learn uh, the field. And <coughs> the only problem is now, at least in our own country, uh, the government is totally uninterested in, uh, in funding that kind of R&D in, uh, uh, in exploration. So I think it's going to be up to the companies and people who have experience in the industry to do this. But I really think that we need to set up some kind of consortium funding of research in geophysical interpretation. And I don't mind, mean by that a better algorithm for inverting data. I, I mean relating the, the, say, conductive or magnetic structures that are seen in data to what's actually in the ground. More, more like a holistic approach. A more holistic approach. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't need a lot of people. It doesn't need a hundred geophysicists to do this. Yeah. We need half a dozen people in the country who take an interest in doing this sort of thing. Okay. But we're yeah. down very close to zero at the present time. Any, any, any comments there? Yeah. Yep. Yep.
Well, just I, I happen to be involved with a, um, a contest called the Frank Arnott Award that the finals will be presented tomorrow afternoon in, in this theater. Um, and one of the things we thought about, this is to honor a colleague, some of you might know him, heard of him, uh, Frank Arnott, he passed away in 2009. But one of the things we definitely thought about was after this sort of, uh, you know, open source uh, contest is that geoscience in Canada definitely needs some ongoing activity like this. And we found that in the oil industry, they have what they call the Imperial Barrel Award. And this is an annual event supported by the oil companies to basically foster excellence among geosci young geoscientists and university, geologists and geophysicists and geochemists if they're present or can be dragged in. And, and uh, so there is, uh, and we found interestingly, one of, the, one of the investment groups in town here, um, not to be named, but they, they actually see the need for improving the level of geoscience in the country. Now this is a group that puts money into companies. They're not a primary explorer, they're not a royalty yeah. group, right? But they don't want to be the lead, they want, to, they want mining companies to basically be the storefront, but they said, we will put money into that. Interesting. And we're only interested if it's multi-year. None of this one trick pony stuff, you know? Like some of the ones that have happened. Oh yeah, we got a million bucks, they do a shark tank at the PDAC and then it's all over. You know, it's just those, those attract a certain group, but universities need some consistency. They need something, a, a target, that's gonna be there over a period of time. So, you know, the, the profs can plan to get yeah. masters or PhD yeah, people right. into that you program need, Yeah, and you have, have a chance. three to five year cycle there. Right so there. There are, there's certainly some ideas, Gordon, I think along that front uh, that there's a gap. And, um, and I think you're right, and, unless we, we cloaked ourselves in a strange way, it, the industry is gonna have to take care of itself with the help of university, hopefully, so. Anything, a uh, question up above on the platform? Upper, upper, uh, upper mic, yeah, yeah, it's in the middle, yeah. Yeah, no, That's no, me. no. Okay. There's no mic. Is there any mic upstairs? No? No. I, um, yeah, Wade Hodges, uh, CEO of Nevada Exploration. And I spent my career in this industry looking at systems, projecting myself into the future, imagining finding big gold mines and coming up with better improved systems. And the entire time, a little voice in the back of my head has been saying, yeah, but you need to... Um, create environments where you can integrate people and open, you know, this environment. So this kind of comments are really important. Carlos's comments have struck a nerve, a chord with me, um, because it's been going on for years. We live in this yep. environment. We're constantly coming back to this theme trying to do it, but we can't seem to move beyond this. In another 10 years, we're going to come back with even more technology and we're going to say, yeah, but we don't have enough people to interpret it and know what to do. Okay, I just recently um, became aware of two things. One, Ryan Holiday wrote a book called Ego is the Enemy. And I imagine in all of this, I see the elephant with all the different disciplines and people rubbing different parts, uh, all talking about what it is, okay? And what I occurs to me is that every one of those people, every one of us, is absolutely right in, in, in what we're seeing and what we're talking about through hard-won experiences, observations of our senses. Okay, and that gives us our egos. We all have them. Get a little distortion filter on our shoulder that starts to say, you can't talk to me like this. I've done, because I've done good things. It's very clear. And so part of the job of management, this interface, is to be that reality um, check. And how do you pierce through this ego? Well, the best thing I've seen is to recognize that in any one of these tables and round dis table discussions, everybody's right, but everybody is, <clears throat> is also incomplete. Yeah, incomplete. Nobody has, not incorrect, just incomplete. We don't have. So right away, you can get rid of that and get back to let's do the lay down and figure out what's going on. So it just, I just had to add that comment, and it's really come to me because I'm now dealing in a system that I've created where it's hard to find, not in people, good people that can interpret the data that we're finding, but people that will show up to work on time with a valid driver's license, that can pass a piss test for drugs, okay? <laughs> that's the level that we're at. So finally, I mean, that's years behind. We're, 
if, if we can find a way, and I don't know that we can't address that, we're the yeah. last group of people to try to talk about human resources, yeah. I think, and to solve that problem. Yeah. But I would just had to say that. Yeah, thanks. Linda? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a, a great uh, comment, uh, which I 100% um, support. So he, you want to do the elephant in the room thing. How many women are in the room? Yeah. And are women generally recognized as being better team players and have less ego? So anyways, <laughs> I'm just saying you want to fix things. Think about how many women are sitting in the room. Thank you. <laughs> good. good job, Linda. Question here in front. Yeah, Norm Patterson. I spent <clears throat> 60 years as an exploration geophysicist, and I'd like to say that I appreciate and agree with Gordon West in his comments about the la lack of uh, interest in geology by a lot of geophysicists, and vice versa. Um, but I'm not going to let the universities totally off the hook in his, because um, there was a time when. Uh, in order to take geophysics, you had to go through the geological stream, and there are a good many universities where that is simply the case, still the case. Uh, that uh, posed problems because the geology stream quite often didn't give the student enough mathematics or physics to uh, allow him to go into a proper uh, role as a geophysicist, but it did give him the interest in, ge in geology, which, which is absolutely vital if you're going to be a practicing exploration geophysicist. Um, and I'd like to make a further comment that um, there are, uh, in, within the universities, uh, geophysicists teaching geophysics who are also interested in geology. And a very notable one, who I'm sure all of you will remember, is Fraser Grant. Uh, Fraser wrote a memorable series of papers on the behavior of iron, uh, and particularly its magnetic properties during metamorphic, metamorphosis, uh, what causes iron to become magnetic. And this is vitally important because the whole uh, magnetic exploration uh, me method relies on magnetite uh, for producing patterns, producing susceptibilities, uh, producing what we use uh, to interpret structure. Uh, Fraser's efforts were pointed directly at this, because uh, when a fault occurs in a magnetic environment, in a, in a, for example, in a volcanic sequence, it destroys magnetite frequently, oxidizes it. On the other, it's often critical. In other cases, in a sedimentary environment, a fault will produce magnetic. Uh, so faults can sometimes be more magnetic or less magnetic. Uh, the same is true of metamorphism. Uh, sometimes uh, not something that's not at all magnetic will become magnetic through the production of magnetite uh, along with other alteration products. So I think that universities can produce uh, scientists of this caliber and of this uh, broad interest. Thank you. Comment? Another question? Hi, Greg, Greg Hodges, um, yeah. a geophysicist. And yeah. for, I don't know, five years, I, was, I taught a, a one-day short course in geophysics for geologists. Um, went through about 15 courses, 500 and something students went through. Geologists from industry, uh, everything from new grads to 30 years or more. And the most common feedback I got at the end of the course from the geologists was, why didn't we learn this at school? And thinking about it, I look back, and it, there really is a problem at the universities. We have several models that don't work. We have universities where the geophysics is in the physics department. The geophysicists don't learn geology, and the geologists don't get much exposure to the geophysics, especially not from exploration people. Um, at my own university, geophysics was in geology, but the geophysics for geologists course was taught by a geochronologist who really knew nothing about exploration. And, there's a real, and this causes these silos then, because geo, I, what I tried to teach the geologists was you've got to understand the rock properties, and it, it's sort of ties in with what Norm was saying. 
We were teaching them, or they were being taught at university, how to calculate the magnetic model of a tabular body, but they weren't being taught what makes a body magnetic or non-magnetic, you know, reduction, uh, alteration, or whatever. And so I think a lot of the problem does come right at the university level that geologists who are going into exploration aren't being taught exploration geophysics. And a lot of geophysicists, we have the problem in Ontario, some of them can't qualify as professional geoscientists because they haven't learned any geology. So it really does go back to a lot of it, to university level. And I guess the industry's got to push the universities to, to try and do a better job of cross-training. Thank you. So, so the question, yeah, the question comment comment question was that the uh, from from a from a, a student that that basically uh, uh, commented that the that the the this type of outreach uh, and I mean I understand what you're saying because I in a way I'm I'm, I'm just as 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 guilty because I I, I do I do the these short courses too and uh, but invariably they're all done for people who've already graduated. And uh, no, it's a good point, and I take and I take it uh, very, very much uh, uh, something to think about. But they were saying that why don't why don't we give these uh, this why don't we do this outreach into right into the universities? And um, I think there there could be some issues within the universities themselves in terms of uh, how they perceive this type of uh, this this type of uh, of, uh, of exercise. Um, but uh, no, it's it's a, it's a good uh, good point to. Well taken. Good point. Thank you very much. Um, is there a question here? Yeah, uh, Peter Bradshaw. I'm an exploration geochemist. I've been around about as long as, as Norm Patterson. Um, I'll just make a, a quick statement and ask a question of, of, of the panel. When, when I started in this business, I, can, I consulted around the world. I mainly consulted for intermediate to, to, to large companies, most of which aren't, aren't around now, like, like Amex and Falconbridge and, and, and Chevron and so on. Those companies had the practice of hiring geologists, moving them through the system, exposing them to different uh, capabilities. That whole whole paradigm changed, and in in Canada and, and and Australia, there was a huge appetite for people to invest in a high risk, high high and high reward area. So, so so two things happened: very experienced people left the intermediate to major companies because they were consolidated and closing and shutting down and 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 downgrading their their, their, their exploration size. A lot of of, of juniors uh, came, came into being. They were able to, to, to get financed. That high risk, high, high, high reward money is no longer there in the exploration business. It, it's there in, in the high tech business. Pe pe people have, have moved you know, uh, somewhere else. So my question 
is if, if you were going to start a company and you wanted to have even a moderate chance of success, you know, I'd say one or two percent, how much money would you need to start with to be able to have that success? How many people would you need to employ in, in order to have the critical mass to get the integration that we've talked about, which I think is, it, is so important, to be able to, 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 cross, to cross boundaries? And anticipating your, your answer, why the hell would you ever start a junior company? Yes. And where is our whole business going? Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good question. Um, Sorry, can I can I just say one yeah, thing? Yeah, go so, ahead, uh, Linda. Peter, you didn't actually introduce yourself, I don't think. So people who don't know, that's Peter Bradshaw. Uh, and uh, talk about innovation. Uh, that's for, he. Uh, the junior company that he was eventually involved in was First Point, and they found an entirely new style of nickel mineralization that nobody had ever thought of before. Uh, and 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 Peter's also a great geochemist. So I just I just wanted to put Peter's uh, comments in that context. Yeah. Um, and the answer is you wouldn't start a public company anymore. In my opinion, you'd want to stay private as long as possible. And that's certainly the people I work with. What we we talk about a lot. And uh, and and part of that's regulatory, right? And the cost of being public is, is a real problem. And the other is so in the old days you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you could start a junior mining company with money from friends and family and about a half a million bucks and you could stake some claims and you could find some outcrop and drill a hole. And now you need a half a million dollars a year just to keep the lights on, to hire a couple of people, half the software licenses, uh, to, uh, you know, pay the accountant to do the financial statements. The, the whole paradigm has so shifted Plus, the problem is that you know, investors have moved on to different kinds of speculative, <clears throat> speculative stocks. I think it's a real problem, and, that, and, and we're, not, we're on the cusp of seeing the problem as uh, you know, we don't have a pipeline of exploration projects to feed um, the big machine. The other thing is that the average capital raising hasn't changed in 20 years. Yeah. No. So you're still, you're still raising about the same amount of money in an IPO. Yeah, a couple of million bucks. But, but yeah. your costs are like... Yeah. yeah, the, the and cost the of regulatory and, and the, compliance yeah. has yeah. increased tremendously, and yeah. at, at, at from all aspects, yeah. whether accounting, legal, uh, you know, whether First it's the environmental, uh, you know, health yeah. and safety, which is okay, right? But there is a cost associated yeah. with these things. Uh, Charles, I just I I want to. We're getting down to the yeah, we're here almost there. I, we're almost there. I thought some of the some of the good, very good comments that came out, and there's a certain element and all of these things about what I call a whinge. Um, you know, is it the companies? <laughs> is it universities? Is it government? Well, they're almost, you know, they've exited stage left. But I had an interesting experience. I've, I've run a workshop based around the Quinell trough data in British Columbia. Uh, and it's one of the Frank Arnott uh, presentations you'll, if you're around tomorrow. But the Geoscience BC, as sort of a para-government group because they had an industry board, but they were funded by the province, uh, had innovation as one of their key aspects of the program. And one of the things they did was they took all of the legacy geochemical uh, stream sediment and lake sediment geochemistry data, which was <coughs> taken over a long period of time, had a whole bunch of legacy issues about leveling and missing data and the rest of it. And they turned it over to a gentleman who was sitting over there a while ago, uh, Colin Barnett, who had developed a neural network approach to working with, uh, with exploration data, and geochemical data was one of them. And so the first task he was, he was assigned was to basically bring it up to a common level. And you know, so you could actually look at grids across the entire area. And, and Wolf, I remember you had a look at some of that data when you did the course in 14. And so he put that part together. Then he actually uh, worked with a uh, geologist who's now with Gold Corp, Thomas Bissick, who was MDRU at the time. And they created basically a geological map from that geochemical database. And that was actually put out for the entire Quinell Trough area where the geochemistry was available. So a new technology approach created a new geological map, which then my understanding is Bissig went out in the summer and he validated enough locations that the geology that was seen in that new map 
was different than the original geology and it could be validated that those rocks were actually there so that the geochemical map, derived map, actually looked to be the superior product. Now the team went together, <laughs> all the groups, the, the yeah. contractors and all the people involved and the BC government geology people got together. I think they were on a frickin' island. They had to keep them in one spot so they didn't break. And they were trying to rationalize how to work through a number of issues. And one of them, what does we do with this map? Well, at they, and in this workshop, we were able to put both maps, the traditional geological map through, you know, probably 20 years of heroic mapping as, as geologists would undertake, and then the new one, which basically had been generated through this neural network. And they left it in the charge of the, of the individual senior geologist in the BC Mines Department, is my understanding, to choose which one. Guess which one he chose? <laughs> he stuck with the old one. We as individuals face change every day. We face it in geoscience and exploration in our profession. And if we choose not to step forward over the area where there doesn't seem to be anything supporting us, we're probably not going to advance. Yeah. I mean, we have to take some ri personal risk. Yeah. Fine, try and change the universities, change the companies. But at the end of the day, what we, the only thing we really have control over, to some degree, is ourselves and our little ego thing on the, on the shoulder, right? So. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, okay. Is there, was there a, 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 make it quick, we only have five minutes left. Uh, uh, I'm Karnakar from Data Code. Neither I'm a geologist nor a geophysicist, but in this industry for the last 20, 25 years, specifically in India. Uh, two comments, uh, two observations as an external who has come into the geoscience industry, I have realized is one, generally when we are talking about integration, we are bringing in all specialists into the group of integration and studying an integrated approach. Now once a, he or she becomes specialist is because of the passion for their own subject and then becoming amalgating into an integrated team becomes difficult. Probably the moderates or the average who, who form the team and then develop that team into an integrated approach I could see much more success, at least in Indi Indian terms. The second thing which I observed primarily, uh, which is happening, not uh, very respect to the integration part, but in geoscience, the data never dies, and the data is growing at a very fast pace, whereas the dissemination of knowledge, which is derived out of this data, is not happening at that pace. So people are accessing this data from public domain or whatever domain, and trying to create colorful maps or models or anything without taking into consideration what are the other knowledge which is already existing in the industry at the same pace. And that's where the gap is increasing day by day. That's what two aspects I could uh, gather from my experience in uh, doing business with Indian geoscience industry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quick comment? No? Okay. Okay, well, that's we're going to wrap, uh, wrap that up. Um, I think there was some uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, let's hope that uh, when we come back at uh, Exploration 27, we're not rehashing the same, <laughs> same story. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Uh, I would thank you very much for, uh, for attending this panel. Um, there is, uh, th there is uh, some posters out in the, in the, in the hall, and... Uh, there's some booths that you can visit, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Good job. <laughs>